June 2010. Fighting erupts between the Uzbek and Kyrgyz communities of southern Kyrgyzstan. The violence spreads from Osh to nearby towns. They came and started looting houses, killing people. Systematic theft, destruction and brutal mob violence. More than 400 people are killed. Three years on, an uneasy peace has returned to this Central Asian nation. I ask God, the government, the court and the law only one thing, to give the killers of my son a life sentence. But not everyone may be equal before the law. Where is the justice? Where is the truth? I'm Robin Forestier Walker, and on this edition of 101 East, we ask what price has been paid for peace here in Osh, and how long can it hold? In the ancient city of Osh, Uzbeks and Kyrgyz live side by side. They share the same faith. The Osh region is part of the Fergana Valley in the heart of Central Asia. The border between Uzbekistan and the Kyrgyz Republic was drawn up during the Soviet Union. Today, around three quarters of a million Uzbeks are citizens of Kyrgyzstan. Most of them live in the south of the country. April the 7th, 2010. There's chaos in the capital as a popular uprising ousts the president. A power struggle ensues. In the south of the country, ethnic Uzbek leaders back the new government and demand greater rights in return. Rumors of Uzbek separatism alarm the Kyrgyz population and tensions build. On the night of June the 10th, crowds of Uzbeks and Kyrgyz clash on the streets of Osh. By morning, gangs of Kyrgyz men begin arriving in Osh from nearby towns and villages. When I heard windows being broken, my legs started shaking. I don't remember whether I was scared for my children or for myself. We were told that the Uzbeks were raping our Kyrgyz women. How could we stay away while this was happening? We had no choice but to go there. I was one of the first foreign journalists on the scene as Uzbeks built defensive barriers and tried to protect their neighborhoods. <laughs> About 400 to 500 people came to my neighborhood. They started killing people. They started looting houses and setting them on fire. And there was also rape. I filmed hundreds of Uzbeks, mainly women and children, pleading on the border with Uzbekistan to be allowed to cross. Over that long weekend, up to 400,000 people were displaced. These people are making uh, unverifiable claims uh, at this stage that it's not just uh, the armed militias that have been shooting at them, but also the Kyrgyz military uh, themselves. This footage appears to show an armoured personnel carrier appearing from behind a Kyrgyz mob and firing towards an Uzbek barricade. Estimates put the final death toll at between 450 and 500 people. Most of them were killed over just a few days.
No inquiries into the Dune events have proven conclusively who was responsible for organising the violence. But credible international investigations did conclude that Uzbek suffered the majority of destroyed properties and deaths. Three years later, the scars from that conflict are still visible, and the pursuit for justice continues. <laughs> This is justice in southern Kyrgyzstan today. Inside the cage is Mohammed Bizarukov. He's accused of killing and decapitating a Kyrgyz man in the June 2010 violence. Security guards attempt to shield him from the victim's relatives. Throughout his trial, they have hurled abuse and attempted to harm him and his family. We find his mother, Rahilia Bizarukova, outside the court waiting for news. She's trying to keep out of sight. After they beat me so badly, I stopped going to the court hearings. On the 19th of June, 2011, three of them came to my house. Koshkonova, her sister and another man. You killed my son. You must find the head of my son. Otherwise, I will drink your blood. And with these words, she beat me. This is the woman alleged to have beaten Rahilia, Dilbar Khochkonova. You were born from my flesh. I cannot forget your bright image. You've gone far away, my only son, and I grieve every hour for you. Dilbar is convinced that Mohamed Bizarukov is responsible for the brutal murder of her son, Almaz Askarov. After two years of retrials and postponements, she has no faith in the court process. I'm Kyrgyz. Why are they neglecting and violating my rights? Why cannot Kyrgyz support each other? Why can't I be heard? I only ask for a life sentence. Why are the court trials not working according to the law? Is there a law in Kyrgyzstan? That's what I'm unhappy about. Now she wants revenge at any cost for her son's murder. It is blood for blood. It is an eye for an eye. It is a Kyrgyz tradition we have inherited from our ancestors. As long as I live, I'll get that blood. Dinara Medietova is a Bizrukov defense lawyer. There's been a lot of violations. There's been torture, there have been threats. My client is Uzbek, and the other side is Kyrgyz. I have to be a patriot. This is what people say. You're Kyrgyz. Why are you defending Uzbeks? But if I don't, who will? The evidence suggests my client is innocent. That evidence includes a signed confession from a man claiming to have witnessed Askarov's murder by two Kyrgyz men. The victim's family are obstructing the course of the trial to such an extent they're threatening, beating up witnesses and the defendant, and even the lawyers. Koshkonova openly threatened me with murder. She said exactly this. I will kill you. The attorney who participated before you died. Now it's your turn. We filmed Dilbar Khochkonova threatening another of the defense lawyers the same way. Dilbar's been accused of assault by the defense team, but she hasn't been charged and she's unapologetic. I haven't put my hands on the lawyers yet, but if they are corrupt and working with guilty people for money, then I think beating them is right. 
Here people say openly that rulings are decided by the masses or by money. Do you know what that means? It means that if there's pressure, the court can rule in favor of the person exercising that pressure. Mohamed Bizarukov's trial has been postponed for the third time in less than a month, and his defense team say he's not getting a fair trial. They're also concerned about the safety of witnesses, and they've asked for the trial to be held outside of Osh. And the problems begin before cases go to trial. Human Rights Watch has been investigating the Kyrgyz justice system in relation to the inter-ethnic conflict. Torture is, is a problem that Kyrgyzstan has been grappling with for a long time, both before and, and since the June 2010 violence. The same problems continue to date, um, problems with, with hostility and attacks in courtrooms, um, allegations of ill-treatment and torture that go uninvestigated, arbitrary arrest. The justice process has been skewed against ethnic Uzbeks. Rahilia already lost a son before Mohammed was arrested. Her youngest, Rachmatullah, was shot dead in the June 2010 clashes. He was shot by a sniper. He was 28 years old. A year later, Mohammed and his father were taken into custody. My husband was a good manager, an honest worker. This photograph was taken when he ran for local council. Mohammed was charged with kidnap her husband, Mamat Aziz, for the murder of Dilbar Khochkhonova's son, Almaz Askarov. They beat my son. Two of his ribs were broken. He had bruises on his body. There is medical proof he was beaten, that he had broken ribs, bruises. They also beat my husband in his kidneys. Mamat Aziz died after 70 days in detention. It was just six days before he was due to go on trial. If they hadn't beaten him, he wouldn't have died. After the death of my husband, they transferred the murder charge to my son. Where is the justice in that? In the pursuit of justice for the 2010 crimes, the Kyrgyz authorities opened more than 5,000 criminal cases. But fewer than 7% of investigations have led to convictions. And the figures reveal a startling ethnic bias. Out of 105 people convicted of homicide, 97 of them were Uzbek. We put those concerns to the Prosecutor General's office. If we talk about the independence of prosecutors, yes, the national law defines and guarantees that prosecutors carrying out their duty are independent. How do you account for the discrepancy between the figures where the majority of individuals being investigated and prosecuted are Uzbek and yet most of the crimes committed were against ethnic Uzbeks? Those crimes are reflected in general statistics. Such official statistical data on special criteria, we, we haven't, like I said, the crimes are covered by general statistics. Osh functions like a normal, busy market town once again. But it's a new kind of normal. In the Uzbek neighborhoods, there's rebuilding going on. But few are prepared to speak openly about their feelings. One local Uzbek man, Ulugbek, did agree to talk if we concealed his identity. Those Uzbeks who were killed during the violence, the authorities did not even try to find out who those people were. No investigations. If they are torturing men who are simply defending their homes and families from the attackers, who would want to live in such a country? Ulugbek's home was looted and torched in 2010. He says he lost everything, including his business. We teach our children to stay away from trouble. The Kyrgyz just want to make sure that Uzbeks know their place. We're caught between two fires, the local people and the authorities. 
Even in small fights, we get harassed, but we can't complain to the police. I don't know what they think about us in their hearts, but I can say that we are treated as second-class citizens. Wedding parties often celebrate in the town centre with a photograph or a dance. Not long ago, any party would have been welcome here. But these days, it's a typically Kyrgyz affair. The distinctive Kelpak hats are a proud badge of identity. That changed political landscape is also reflected in the new monuments erected since 2010. There's little to infer from these Kyrgyz motifs that Osh is an ethnically mixed city. <laughs> Melis Mirzagmatov is the Kyrgyz mayor of Osh and he invites me especially to see one of his proudest landmarks, the epic Kyrgyz hero Manas. As you see it, he's representative of everyone, but maybe not everybody sees him as representative. Manas united all ethnic groups to fight the aggressor. Was he a bloodsucker or magnanimous? This is what matters. What does it have to do with ethnicity? Melis Mirzagmatov has been branded a dangerous nationalist and provocateur by his critics. Efforts to introduce international peace monitors after 2010 were stymied by his supporters. And he stood down attempts by the government in Bishkek to fire him. He's a powerful figure. Is anyone afraid of you? At Minya? Me? <laughs> At Minya, no, no. Maybe the criminals are afraid of me. Maybe people who don't pay taxes or litter in the streets are afraid of me. Maybe drug lords are afraid of me. I can tell you one thing. I am supported by the ordinary people. The people support me, not the bureaucrats. That support is strong, particularly in the south, in the rural uplands. Many of the men who participated in the violence came from here. I travelled to the Alai region to meet some of those who consider the mayor a hero. Milis Mirzakmatov has very serious support here. He is developing the city of Osh. He is doing everything he can to improve life in the town. If all our leaders were like him, the Kyrgyz nation would prosper. Janarbek Suluyev lost his brother during the fighting. My brother's son studies at elementary school. I tell him to be a good kid, but he says that when he grows up, he will cut all the Uzbeks. I don't want him to grow up and kill Uzbeks. I want him to live a good life. I tell him it was a war and that wars are always like that. But when he gets angry, he still says, damn those Uzbeks, I will take revenge for my father. Sagandak Jusiev went to fight in Osh in June 2010. I think I did the right thing. If a Kyrgyz doesn't protect the Kyrgyz land, Kyrgyz people, he is hardly a Kyrgyz. I had to protect my motherland, my people. I don't blame Uzbeks. It is not their fault. It is the politicians and the Uzbek people with power. The people wouldn't have done it by themselves. It was one person who put the whole of Osh in jeopardy. That person now lives in exile. Kadirjan Batirov was sentenced to life in absentia by the Kyrgyz authorities for organizing the unrest and for separatism. We thought that Democrats had come to power and we wanted to support democracy. And as a result, we were punished for that. In May of 2010, Kadirjan Batirov made a fateful speech from the steps of the college he founded.
Biz bu ziyan bir bende kek dirajlanın bir dastoyunu onunumuz bozun da vettili yapız. Olaymen ki başka her bir de doğru kadamımız aşağı etilgen nasıl yanayan bir yakınlaştırıp yanayan bir asas bir zemin yaratı yaptı. This privately funded university was part of the vision Uzbek leaders like Kadir Can Batirov had for their community. Today, it lies in ruins. Do you feel any personal responsibility for the way things are in Kyrgyzstan today? I was talking about the rights of Uzbeks. That's what we were trying to demand. I only regret one thing, that today there's not a single person who can say what I said. The Uzbek people are intimidated to such an extent, they're so afraid they can't even point out their murderers. These men killed my children, these men looted my house, these men set my son, my house on fire. Uzbek voices fell silent after June 2010, when Uzbek broadcasters were shut down. But now, that language is back on air. Friendship Radio is a mixed language service, with support from international donors like USAID. It's one example among many peace-building initiatives in Kyrgyzstan. Ah, inshallah, inshallah. Farhat Madkasimov is ambitious, Uzbek, and relentlessly upbeat. During my on-air time, I noticed that a lot of listeners have forgotten their grievances. The most important thing is, there's inter-ethnic friendship. Even the way people look at each other is full of love. I think it's one of our biggest achievements. Can you describe a little bit about uh, what it was like for you uh, during the violence uh, in 2010. How, how did it affect you and your family? As a professional, Farhat would rather move forward than dwell on the past. Please don't ask me political questions. To be honest, during my broadcast, I'm a happy person and I don't talk about political issues. But Dilbar Khochkonova is not ready to move on. I don't want anything to do with Uzbeks. I have nothing in common with them. That's why I realize I'm a nationalist. Whenever I see them, my blood starts boiling for what they did to my son. Yes, I am a nationalist, and I hate myself for that, but I can't change it. Back at the court, the Bizirukov defense team have been given some positive news. I'm very happy that they've agreed for the case to be sent somewhere else. The Supreme Court will decide when and where. That gives Rahilia some grounds for hope. But her struggle doesn't end there. She's still waiting for investigations into the killing of her youngest son and her husband's death in custody. And that sense of injustice felt by many will have implications for the future. It's a tenuous piece uh, at, at best. It's, it's as long as the grievances of the ethnic Uzbek community are real, as long as the ethnic Uzbek community doesn't feel that they have access to justice in a meaningful way, um, I think that, that, that we can't talk about a lasting and meaningful calm uh, for Osh, for southern Kyrgyzstan. Farhat moonlights as a party MC and he's invited me to an Uzbek wedding. This mixed neighborhood was one of the areas worst affected by the conflict. Tonight's an important milestone. There hasn't been music and dancing on this scale since before the violence. It's already in the past, because now people have a good relationship with each other. We're loving towards each other. The truth is, there's hardly a Kyrgyz face amongst these revelers. Trust was one of the first casualties of the conflict, 
and restoring it could take at least a generation. This occasion shows a community coping, but the wounds of Osh have a long way to heal.